Welcome to the show. It's the Jerry Ratcliffe Show. I'm Chris Graham, and I've got Jerry Ratcliffe here. We haven't talked for a couple of weeks just because of all the travel involved with the ACC tournament, NCAA tournament. But uh, we're back uh, in the uh, our respective home studios. And Jerry, a lot to catch up on. First off, buddy, hope you're doing okay. Yeah, bounce back. I got a little under the weather there. With uh, Got worn down at the end of the season and I think uh, finally caught up with me and bouncing back now, though. So everything, this is uh, spring weather we're having today certainly helps. <laughs> it doesn't hurt at all. 75 degrees or more. Uh, 75 on my side, probably closer to 80 on your side of the hill uh, in central Virginia. Uh, you, you know, the last time we talked, it was before the ACC tournament. Virginia gets to the final, loses to Duke, ends up getting a four seed in the NCAA tournament draws Furman as an opponent, gets a big lead. Uh, it's the NCAA tournament. Things happen, and Virginia loses in the first round down in Orlando. I was down there. Hey, there was nice weather in Orlando, if nothing else, while I was down there. Um, but uh, a lot's happened. And uh, where do you want to start, Jerry, with um, with breaking down the way the last couple of weeks went down? Hell, well, you know, it's, it's interesting because I, I didn't think – this Virginia season would end until tonight, really. <laughs> yeah. uh, I thought they'd be playing Alabama and Louisville in the Sweet 16 or the uh, round of 32, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, I, I, you know, I was as surprised as everybody else that uh, what happened against Furman, I, I didn't think there was hardly any way in the world they would lose that game, and I'd still – don't think that they should have. Um, just another one of the postseason uh, disappointments that this program has suffered through in, in the last, I don't know, seven, eight years, I guess, something like that. But um, I really I really expected them to win that game and beat San Diego State and, uh, and move on to this round where I thought it would end. But uh, – I guess uh, a better Alabama team, but but a team that I still think that they could probably have played with. How about I think, you? I think the loss of Ben Vanderplas before the ACC tournament was bigger than we may have thought at the time because during the ACC tournament, uh, the team stepped up. You know, uh, uh, Francisco Caffaro, uh started all three games in Greensboro. Uh, Caden Shedrick, though, got more minutes off the bench and played great. He had five blocks in the win over North Carolina. Uh, he he scored and rebounded well in the, in the Clemson and Duke games. Um, so you thought, hey, okay, they got it figured out. And actually, Shedrick had a, a really nice statistical game uh, against Furman, 15 points, 13 boards, four blocks. Uh, he was five of six at the line, five of nine from the field. You know, he did he did everything he could ask to do. But when Furman went to that one three one zone defense, um, when they got their their big guy Mike Boswell with a fourth foul uh, or, uh, midway through the second half, um, you know if you have Vanderplas in the game to set a high screen to you know maybe play a screen and roll game there against that 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 point man in the one three one zone, maybe that changes things a bit because you know if, if you if you don't keep pay attention to him, he can knock down that three. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those things They, you know, it happens in a season. Virginia had injury issues, not many, but they certainly, you know, Reese Beekman only missed one game, but he was, he was uh, limited a bit at, at times this season with the ankle and hamstring injuries and then losing Vanderplas there at the end. I, I you know, it's, it's one of those things. I, I don't even know if the Furman coach tries the one, three, one zone, if he's got Vanderplas out there to worry about. So it's just little things, uh, and of course, even all that said, they you know Virginia came back after giving up that deficit, or giving up that lead, I should say, and had the game in hand and, and just couldn't close it out. So, uh, you know, a lot of what ifs, but uh, you, you know, you pointed it out, Jerry. Disappointments in recent years. Virginia is six and three in their last four NCAA tournament appearances. All six wins in 2019, three first round losses as the higher seed. So that's part of that part of the Virginia uh, history right now. Yeah, and it's it's disappointing for sure. Uh, all those losses have come against teams that shouldn't have beat them, obviously. And uh, you know, I, I don't know what you say about that. Uh, I agree. I think they did miss Vanderplas more than people will 
probably realized at the time. And uh, it was good to see Shedrick finish strong uh, and, and have a good tournament, uh, ACC and NCAA. Um, I ended up felt, feeling bad for Kia because a lot of people ended up blaming him for that loss because of that errant pass he threw at the end when he got trapped in the corner on the a, – a, not a very strong inbounds play. Uh, but my argument is the game was lost long before that. Uh, you, you go, what was it, seven, eight minutes uh, in the middle of an NCAA tournament game without a basket. Um, that's where they lost the game, I thought. Uh, it wasn't, should it should have never come down to the end, but uh, unfortunately it did. Virginia was four of 13 from the field, only one turnover. Well, two turnovers, if you count, the, certainly count the fast break turn or the, uh, the, the end turnover there. Uh, but against the one, three, one zone, four for 13 with, with the one turnover in 11 minutes plus. Uh, and uh, I've actually seen Jerry, I don't know if you've seen this, um, you know, af after the game right away, you know, my attention was on, you know, the, the key Hayes role in that last play. I saw Sean Singletary, and then I've seen a couple other people kind of do the X's and O's of that play and actually saying, well, maybe it wasn't as much Kihei as it was actually Shedrick. Uh, the way that way that inbound play is designed to run is your center is supposed to be at half court. Uh, and, and when Kihei throws that ball up there, he's thinking Shedrick's the guy there. And um, if nothing else, he at least battles for that ball. It's not an easy steal for the firm and center and an easy outlet pass to the three-point shooter. Um, and all that said, then the guy's got to still make the shot. The, the, yeah. the JP Pegwas had not made, he had not made a three pointer all game. He was, he was a four of seven at the foul line. He was shooting horribly all game long and he drained that shot. Boy, you know, I was in the arena that that's a sound I will not forget. That was the, you know, the, there was a big Furman crowd there. And then of course, whenever a top seed or top seeded type team is, is losing in a first round game, uh, the other fans tend to you know, hop on the bandwagon there a bit. Uh -huh. And uh, boy, that was, you know, that was a sound I won't forget. Uh, I was, I was stunned. A lot of us were stunned on press row. I was sitting with a, a, uh, several other Virginia beat writers and, and reporters and uh, um, not a lot to say about that one that day. And, you know, you just chalk it up and yeah, you, you feel horrible for Kihei and he had to answer all the questions after the game. And, you know, Tony seemed to take it obviously pretty, pretty hard too. He was, he was as subdued as I've seen him. Uh, after after a loss uh, in, in in several years, yeah, cause, because this season started out with such promise. Uh, if I were a betting man back in November, I would have bet the house that this team was a probably a Sweet Sixteen team, or, or certainly close to it. Uh, the way they started out, playing so well against Baylor and Illinois and Michigan on the road, and then. Uh, fighting Houston to the to the very end of that game, um, and you know beating some pretty good ACC teams along the way, but um, you know things faltered as, as the season went along, and they struggled in a couple of spots. And uh, again, that Vanderplas injury certainly. Took some wind out of the sail, but uh, I I think, in my own personal opinion, that um, and two things, and, and you and I discussed this, and I think we both agreed during the season that they never really established a go-to guy, uh, that somebody that could take a game over, uh, somebody that could put the team on his back and get them a basket when they really needed one. Uh, never really happened. Um, and I, I think that they slacked off on their three point shooting big time. Uh, I know statistically it dropped off the counter. Uh, they opened the season as one of the hottest three point shooting teams in the country, uh, for the first month or so. And then, uh, that certainly dwindled as the season went along. And I, I just I think I think uh, Chris that they need to recruit uh, 
more pure shooters into the program. I've I've always felt that way, and not many years have they had what I thought was an adequate number of pure shooters. They now they've had a lot of scores, but not pure shooters, and I think that jumps up and bites them at some really critical times uh, in their past, particularly in the NCAA tournament when it seems like a lot of the upsets come from less uh, less superior teams who do get hot from the three-point line and and take take out some of the favorite teams. You know, going into the Furman game, I remember the game report I did, the pregame report I did, Furman um, last year was like around, you know, 10th or so in the country in three-point shooting percentage. This year, their percentage was way down. They were closer to 100 and plus uh, in percentage. But in terms of number of makes and number of attempts per game, they were still top 10. And uh, it was something like 9.5 makes out of 27.5 um, attempts per game. They were 10 for 28 in the game against Virginia. They were right on target, but Virginia was two for 12. And so, uh, you know, yeah, you know, when you looked at all the stats of that game uh, at different points of that game and at the end of that game, you know, Virginia shot better from the field. They, they got to the rim more. They were 17 of 22 at the line, some critical misses late, obviously. The, the missed front end of a one and one by Isaac Neely, uh, the missed front end of a two shot foul by Kia Clark. If, you know, one of those goes in, you know, that three pointer ties the game and goes to overtime. If they all go in, the game's over before it even matters. Um, but, you know, Furman, Furman made their threes at the critical times, and Virginia didn't have that. You, you know, you mentioned that, you know, first month of the season, I, you know, from, from the game reports I did each game, I, it seems to me that end of February, Virginia was a top 15 team nationwide in three point shooting percentage. They were 38% or so up yeah. until sometime in February. And then that's when it really fell off the, the table there. And, and uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's a priority. It's gotta be a priority going into next season. I know that coach Bennett and staff, when you start looking around at the guys, they've uh, been reaching out to, uh, and the transfer portal, you know, looking at, and we'll talk about this more in, in a minute or two about next year's roster. It does seem like even with the, with the bigs that they're looking at and, and reaching out to that they're prioritizing three point shooting and maybe a, a guard or two as well, because boy, yeah. I mean, you don't have to go any further than the Virginia game against Furman or the Purdue game against Fairleigh Dickinson. Purdue was five of 26 from three and that loss to Fairleigh Dickinson and the, the shortest team in the country beat, the biggest team in the country uh, by basically daring the guards to shoot and the guards couldn't shoot. And in, in a one and done situation uh, that can prove fatal. And Virginia has actually seen that a couple of times and produce P Purdue hit it this year. But um, you know, that's something that Tony and staff need to address going in to, to next season, no doubt. And particularly when you're Virginia and you have a lower possession rate than, <clears throat> than the average team in the country there's just not as many possessions and when another team hits 10 three-pointers against you um that's almost like in a normal game somebody hitting 15 or more so um i i, I think it hurts and, and again that they, they just don't seem to have a guy who wants the ball in his hand at the end of a game and you look back at that national championship team chris everybody wanted the ball in their hands at the end of the game kyle guy ty jerome uh deandre hunter he, he might have not been known as a as uh the, the highest or the the most uh sure-fired shooter on the team although his field goal percentage and his three-point percentage at the end of that season were higher than Jerome's and guys uh, from not only the, the field, but also from the three point line. So um, all three of those guys were people that lived for that moment, wanting the last shot if they could get it and making big shots. And uh, that that's, that's something that's been missing from the program, I think, ever since. 
Well, we never got to see the full potential of the 2021 team, I guess, the team that, you know, got to the, the four seed and lost because they, they didn't get to practice for a week. Um, that team had Sam Hauser, Trey Murphy, and, and Jay Huff, all of whom are in the NBA right now. Yeah. And um, but that that's you know, that that was the aberration in between. And really, you know, thinking back, I mean, Joe Harris and Malcolm Brogdon, even Anthony Gill certainly as a as a third option. And then that that 2018 group or 2019 group uh with with a mentioned guy, Jerome and Hunter and um Braxton Key and other guys played in the NBA. He was a fourth oh. option on that team. And then the the Huff and and Hauser um and Murphy group and you know the guys that are on the roster now, and and, and certainly the the core of which is expected back next year. Um, all talented players, all great young men, but nobody has that killer instinct. And you you think about, I still go back to to Malcolm Brogdon. I mean, a guy, you know, somebody who could just say, "I'm taking the team on my back right now. Things aren't going well." Joe Harris did it a few times as well. Ty Jerome did it a few times. Um, uh but nobody yeah no nobody seen you know, on this group the last couple of years um it's it they're they're almost like they're too equal to each other and they're all too deferential to each other they don't want to you know shoot a bad shot and and as a result somebody at the end of a shot clock has to shoot a bad shot kihei clark got all the, the blame because i oh, look at kihei he's running through the lane trying to do something he was the only guy trying to do something a lot of times um and he's gone <laughs> he's, he's he's done now um, somebody's gonna have to step up next year and who, who could it be? I mean, if Reese Beekman had, I've, I've been saying this for three years now, if Reese Beekman had Malcolm Brogdon's want to Reese Beekman would already be in the NBA. Cause he's, he, he's as talented as anybody we've seen go through the Tony Bennett era, but he's just too nice. Yeah. I, I think if it's going to be anybody's team next year, it has to be Beekman's team. He's the guy that, that has to take over, has to take charge, says, follow me. And it was encouraging hearing that that at halftime it gets Herman that he was in the locker room trying to get his teammates fired up about winning the game. And uh, so that that's an encouraging sign, assuming that that's an accurate report. Uh, he's got to be the guy uh, there's I don't see anybody else coming back uh I think McNeely could be that kind of guy but again he's only going to be a sophomore he may be a, a little reluctant to do that same thing with Dunn uh we don't know if Franklin's coming back or not I just don't see anybody else whose team it that it, it could be that it should be and Bigman has the overall talent, the experience, everything else now that he's got to be the guy. And I'll say I worry a little bit about this, uh, and, and it's a good worry because Virginia's got a talented point guard ready to replace Kia Clark in the form of Dante Harris, the Georgetown guard transfer, who actually joined the, the program as a redshirt midseason this year and practice with the team so he's familiar with with the team he's familiar with what uh the system is offensively and defensively but here here's my worry you know a lot of, a lot of folks this time last year when kihei was discussing coming back and eventually confirmed he was coming back well isn't that going to stunt the growth of, of beekman because you know he needs to be the point guard and you know what happens if if kihei ends up being the point guard again well i mean harris is a six foot point guard and 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 you know, Beekman is not going to develop as the leader of this team as a 6'3 shooting guard. He's not a shooting guard. He's a point guard. Um, and, you know, unless the, the plan is, you know, let's assume Franklin comes back and, and, then, and then McNeely starts and then the plan is for Harris to be the backup point guard, still get 25 minutes game, kind of like Kia got as a freshman, you know, back in 2018, 2019. If the plan is to start Harris and Beekman beside each other, I, I I think Beekman is so deferential that I'm afraid he's going to end up letting Harris run the team. And, you know, that's going to be another, another year where Beekman could be, and it, it is a very talented, probably the most talented guy we've seen since that, that group of, of Jerome and Guy and Hunter uh, in a Virginia uniform, but he's going to once again, let someone else take the lead because it just seems like that might be his nature. Yeah. And that's, that's something that's, I've been concerned about for the last couple of years. It just seems like 
his nature. He, he's such a good kid, such a good guy that that he is reluctant to, to take a shot or to take over. And they need that kind of leadership that from him moving forward. I, I think they needed it this past season, but they truly need it moving moving forward. So Virginia, we know we'll lose going into next season. Uh Kia Clark, we mentioned, uh Francisco Caffaro, we know we knew anyway, but he's he's uh now put his name in the transfer portal. Most likely will end up playing somewhere professionally next year. He's already been at Virginia for five years. Um and uh also Ben Vanderplas, of course, the grad transfer from, from Ohio. Um is, is lost. Jaden Gardner and Jaden Gardner, of course, too. Yeah, uh, and boy, he, you know, on Senior Day, he was so emotional. Uh, you talk about he—he he, he was only there, quote unquote, for two years, but you could you could just see the emotion in him uh, when he was he was honored his with his family before Senior Day. He he obviously got a lot of his two years in Virginia. So there's some big big holes to to fill for uh, the staff, and there's there's guys internally. You know, we're having to assume a lot here. Uh, we're recording this on Thursday. I'm saying that out loud because. We've already seen one name in the transfer portal, Francisco Caffaro. There's other. There's been rumors the last few days about some other guys who might throw their names into the transfer portal. Um, you know, I'll, I'll throw the names out because I don't. You know, who knows the, the the truth, veracity of any of this stuff? But some folks have been saying Isaac Trout is is ready to go into the portal, which he was a redshirt this year uh, his, as a, as a freshman. Um, so there's speculation there. That's all that is. Um, you know, when you look at the at the roster. In the forward spots, um, you know, Caden Shedrick, assuming he comes back, who knows about Caden? Um, there had been some worry about him when he wasn't getting minutes that that maybe he was he would be headed to the portal. Then he got minutes at the end of the season. But Shedrick, if he does come back, would be the veteran there. And then you'd have Dunn, you could have Trout, um, uh, and uh, the incoming uh, player from the Northwest, uh, Blake Buchanan, the four star from Idaho. Uh, and then they're looking at some guys on the portal who are bigs, and there's quite a few of those guys out there that Virginia has made contact with. Um, what what stands out is that there's definitely some spaces to fill in the front court, uh, and in the back court, I think the back court. If when you talk about Harris coming in, you, if Beekman stays, which a lot of people assume will be the case, everything I'm hearing about Armand Franklin is he's he is interested in coming back as as long as they'll have him back, and who wouldn't have your leading scorer come back if he wants to come back, McNeely. Uh, as as a you know rising sophomore, and then Elijah Gertrude coming in off of an ACL injury, from, which caused him to miss his last year of high school. Uh, there's a lot of uh, depth in the back court. It's the the questions to me seem like they'd be more in the front court. Yeah, yeah, we've heard all the rumors that that Shedrick might not be happy the way things went down. Uh, all like all the like you said, he ended up with a strong finish and that Trout may be homesick. Uh, we don't know if any of these things are, are true or or whatever, and I guess we'll find out in the coming days. And I am glad you threw the timeline in there because it is Thursday, and I know there's been times in the past we've done these podcasts and uh, overnight things have changed dramatically, and football and basketball so uh but yeah they they have reached out to some big guys and some backcourt guys um one guy i wrote about this morning uh blue cane uh six four shooting guard from knoxville was the uh only signee that georgia tech had in the uh signing period back in november uh, he's a top 80 ESPN player. And uh, some people that I know uh, who covered him some in high school when he was in Knoxville, he, I think this past season he played in Florida, but um, said he's the best pure shooter they've seen uh, in the high school ranks. So um, that's certainly the, somebody uh, and he. He decommitted or got out of his NI, uh, NIL um, after Josh Pastner was dis dismissed uh, shortly at the end of the se season. Um, he's going to be highly pursued because he can shoot 
I've watched a video of this kid. He can shoot the eyes out of he he's he just uh and God, it'd be great to have another really good shooter like uh, McNeely out there. Uh what a threat that would be having two perimeter threats like that on the same team. Um they've, they've reached out to a bunch of other guards. Uh, uh a guy from Wofford, Jackson Pavletsky, I guess, he's six three. Um, some other uh, big guys, uh, Jonathan Beagle from Albany, uh, 6'10 freshman, uh, averaged 12 points and seven rebounds this past season. Elijah Hut Hutchins Everett, 6'11 sophomore from Austin P. Um, uh, guy from Texas Tech, Robert Jennings, 6'7. I, uh, I haven't heard that much about him, so I, I don't know how interested they might be. Um, there's a guy uh, from American, uh, Johnny O'Neill, who I don't know a whole lot about. He averaged uh, 11 points and seven rebounds and shot. He is a three-point shooter. He's been uh, contacted by Virginia and a bunch of other, I think, other more than 25 other other schools. Um, it's a guy from uh, um, Merrimack, I think, that uh, Virginia has, can been has been in contact with. I can't find his name amongst all the other. Uh, Jordan have, Minor. He's a he's a yeah, four year player, so he'd be a fifth year guy next year. Yeah, he's the only one that looks like he's a fifth year guy. Um, and then there's another one, uh, Colorado State, John Tanji. Uh, don't know a lot about him, but he uh, has been contacted by Virginia and about 20 other schools. So uh, there's so many people in the portal as of the other day. Uh, you know, you don't know how long it's going to take these people to come up with a, a list of their top choices and make visits and and uh I guess Tony and, and his guys have to look and see who's who might fit Virginia's program too. So um which is going to be very important because potentially if everybody does come back um they don't lose anybody. This could be a more talented team next year, Chris, than it, it was this past season. Mm, yeah, and I look at the fact that the staff is reaching out to all you know these players you mentioned uh, uh, just to gauge interest as maybe a uh, sort of a um, hedge against maybe another guy or two throwing their names out there. You know, we mentioned a couple of names that have, of some fans have been speculating um, have have possible interest in leaving or at least looking at the potentially greener pastures, <clears throat> but you know, the staff would know better than anybody. And, you know, the fact that they're looking at one guard and then several bigs tells you that it, it, it might not be that any bigs are leaving. It might just be that, you know, like, kind of like I mentioned with Sh uh, Shedrick, if he's back, he, you know, there's the, the, the guy who would play in the front court alongside him would be a, a younger guy. It could be a Dunn starting. It could be a Trout starting. It could be a Buchanan starting. And, you know, the idea could be, hey, we'd like to get a veteran guy in here to at least push those young guys to make right. them earn the start. And, he, and then we have the, the older guy to be a backup. So, um, but yeah, that, the talent's out there. And boy, I don't envy anybody uh, in college coaching right now, head coaches, assistant coaches, you know, the the season ends and you have to start right away to work because I mean, gosh, the next day after North Carolina, for example, turned down the NIT, a potential NIT bid, there were already four guys in the portal um, from their school. And you have to go out and start combing the, you know, the, the interwebs yourself to, to find guys and make phone calls and do zooms and everything else. Uh, get guys on campus. And, you know, this is, this is crazy. It's just, I can't imagine how tough it is, uh, you know, to, to do what they're doing. Uh, considering the grind that they went through from early October all the way to get to the stage they got now. Yeah, no question. It, it's got to be tough 
being a college coach these days, uh, not only do you have to go through all the high school, normal high school recruiting as you always did before, but dealing with the portal, the comings and goings in the portal every year, um, it just must be all consuming and mind boggling and take up so much more time than recruiting used to. And recruiting is always taking up uh, tremendous amounts of time for coaches. Uh, not only just physically going to see them play and evaluating them, but um, just finding who's out there and, and who might fit your program and are they academically sound? Uh, you know, uh, that's another worry that Virginia has that some schools don't have to deal with. Um, I, I just can't imagine how much time these guys spend just on those aspects of finding players and, and trying to identify who might work with the rest of the team chemistry wise. You know, for how many years, Jerry, for you, 40 plus years, uh, me 20 plus, uh, you know, we, we would go through a season just covering it and get tired. I mean, we talked about how the last few weeks we've been running on fumes a bit. Um, you know, your body starts to break down after, you know, what we do and all we're doing is covering the games. Um, they're coaching them. And now, now the next part of the season for them. Now, I guess it also means more work for us because basketball season is not over yet. In that sense, uh, we, we'll be writing about basketball for a while. It seems. Yeah. I think last year uh, on these podcasts, uh, week after week, it was ongoing. Just who's leaving, who's coming in, uh, what the hell they might fit, et cetera. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, football and basketball. It's it's almost a year-round sport like the NFL and the NBA now. He's got, uh, with, with all the uh, transfer, of course, the transfer rules are changing, so that might cut down a little bit uh, some of this movement, but uh, no time soon. <laughs> So um, let's go through, maybe wrap up basketball, some other news and notes. Let's start with women's swimming. Uh, women's swimming, a third straight na national championship for the UA UVA women's swimming team. Um, you know, let's just say it like it is. Virginia is a, a women's swimming school now. <laughs> uh, they, they built a dynasty, Chris. I mean, <laughs> three national titles in a row is in any sport – uh, on any level is mind boggling. And, uh, and not only have they just, have they won those three championships, they've been dominant. I mean, they have just, they're breaking all kinds of records left and right. And it's just what they've done is, is just, uh, it's hard to wrap your mind around how good they have been. It is, uh, you know, this year, the, um, you know, pulling up the, the story real quick, uh, Kate Douglas, three individual wins. Um, the senior has now seven individual NCAA championships in her career. Uh, just an amazing career for her. Gretchen Walsh won her second NCAA title of the meet uh, with a hundred uh, yard freestyle win, um, which she defended. She had won that as a freshman last year, Alex Walsh, um, uh, with with and then the relay teams actually they closed out I think they won five of the relay um, uh, championships did this team so just an amazing run for this program um, you know when I say there Virginia is a women's swimming school now that replaces Virginia being a men's tennis school because the men's tennis <laughs> program has obviously been dominant the last few years as well uh, and that, now we're in that season uh, the spring season with that um, baseball also. Uh, getting ready to host Florida State first weekend series at the Dish, uh, starting tomorrow. Uh, early start now scheduled. Uh, originally scheduled to be a night game. Now a one o'clock start with potential rain, potential for rain tomorrow night in Charlottesville area. Um, but Florida State coming to town, Virginia, with weekend series wins in its first two ACC road weekends at North Carolina and then at North Carolina State, taking the first two games of both those series and losing the finale, but going four and two on the road against top twenty opponents. Uh, has vaulted Virginia into the top 10 nationally, as high as number seven in the national polls. And um, 
So Bron O'Connor, once again, he's 19 and two at this stage when, you know, after last year's hot start. And then they faded down the stretch. One thing that may be different to Jerry about this year and the hot start is, uh, you know, last year, maybe at 26 and three, there was a kind of soft schedule to get to that stage. Um, right now, you got to say with these series wins at North Carolina, at North Carolina State, this Virginia team's a little bit battle tested at this point. Yeah, they are. And, and they've been so well rounded, too. Um, I know my son was over there yesterday for the uh, GW game. And uh, in preparation of this weekend, um, and uh, he was really impressed with, and and we all have been with just what a, what a well-rounded team they have. Not only is <clears throat> really good offensively, but defensively, which is something that uh, O'Connor insists upon, and solid pitching staff as well. And then football news: uh, spring practice. We're in week two. I guess week two would have started on Tuesday because they started last Tuesday on the fourteenth. And to me, Jerry, the big news with football, uh, it's the feel-good story of the fact that Mike Hollins is not just back at practice, hanging around, looking at everybody, inspiring them. He's actually out there with them in pads, uh, a full participant uh, for those who, um, you know, obviously we, we all remember November 13th, unfortunately, and that'll be a day a lot of us remember for a long time. Mike Collins was the fourth uh, football player and one of the five uh, UVA students in, in, overall who were shot um, three football players died. Mike Collins survived after uh, suffering life-threatening wounds. He was told originally that it would take him four to six months just to be able to put his own socks on. Within four months, he's practicing with the football team as a full participant. That's just an amazing story. It truly is, and uh, I salute him for uh, meeting with us and, and opening up his uh, thoughts and, and sharing what he went through and his struggles and his uh, comeback, which is so inspiring. Um, you know, it's difficult for anyone to do that, particularly, I think, uh, someone of of his age to uh, have to deal with all that. And uh, I appreciate him being so good opening up to us. And, and uh, Keith uh, Gaither, his running backs coach, talked about him and uh he said uh i guess his aha moment was when they do the wahoo winter workouts and they do the old pad drill where uh you're running in place and diving onto a mat or the ground and uh jump back up again and do it all over again and they do it until you puke pretty much <laughs> um and he the very first day they were doing that and Hollins was right there with everybody else, and and Gaither said, "Yeah, yeah, Mike's back. You uh, <laughs> can do this. He's back." So uh, uh, I salute him for uh, his intestinal fortitude for being able to to uh, handle all this, not only physically but uh, more so mentally, and yeah, he, uh, wish him well throughout he, the spring. He mentioned repeatedly through that uh, that meeting with reporters the other day how the physical part was actually easy compared to the mental uh, and emotional parts that yeah. it, it probably won't be anything he'll go th be able to get through anytime soon um that might be a lifelong thing for him um but uh, yeah amazing young man can't wait to see him carry the flag on the field um you know out there the season opener in a few months uh down at in nashville against tennessee um, he doesn't have to gain a yard or score a touchdown, though we certainly hope – just the idea of him scoring a touchdown in a game uh, and, and kind of bringing that full circle kind of gets me uh, all emotional too. So, yeah, what a, what a great young man and a great story there. So, Jerry, uh, I guess we can wrap up now. Uh, I, I know we like to thank the people who help us make this uh, possible, so you want to thank the sponsors for us. Yeah, no, we'll be uh... – following football all the way through the spring game, which is the middle of April. And uh, as you will, uh, on August of free press and uh, all the uh, basketball, hopefully comings and no goings. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors. Um, Aberdeen Barn finest steakhouse in Virginia. Uh, 
I gotta get over there soon. I'm I'm yearning some red meat. <laughs> I need to need to get over there with this spring weather and uh, and jump on some ribs or a steak or something. And uh, uh, not a better place to do it in in uh, the state of Virginia than right here in our own backyard. And um, gosh, our uh, our good friends at uh, Roback. Uh, been so good. A Charlottesville-based activewear company have men's and women's lines with, and uh, they just uh, come come back out with. Uh, I think they call it their Augusta line. Uh, it makes you feel like you're at Augusta National. Their their clothing is so bright and uh, colorful and uh, and comfortable. Uh, you can't go wrong. So uh, check out their ad on our website. And uh, use code Jerry, J E R R Y, and get twenty percent off your order. Helps us and helps them, and uh, helps some of the UVA athletes like E A Clark, who has an IL uh, through them. Uh, so we want to definitely thank those sponsors, along with uh, Ragged Mountain Running Shop, and um, we're hopeful we may have another uh, podcast advertiser this time next week chris so uh we'll be talking about them as well great to hear i've been i'm seeing more rowback uh, gear uh on my side of the mountain here too so um I, somebody a I saw this, yeah yeah i saw it somebody a wearing a, a rowback virginia uh, uh something uh at the grocery store the other day so i actually wanted to say something like hey <laughs> you know hey i'm a virginia guy too but uh yeah tony uh, i saw tony bennett wearing a rowback uh Q uh Q zip okay uh, the other day at, at practice I think so um yeah everybody's uh, wearing rowback so don't be don't be left out guys don't be the last one left out that's right and that's gals right. <laughs> and gals that's, that's right women better for the women too out there so <laughs> well thanks Jerry thanks to the listeners out there uh we'll uh go go to jerryrackliff.com augustafreebreast.com for the latest on Virginia sports everyone have a great week. <laughs>